Welcome to an APH Access Academy, one in a series of The Road Ahead. Today is Career Readiness Preschool. Erica, would you like to get us going? Yes, let's get this show on the road. So first we would like to introduce ourselves. Uh, actually, I will introduce our panelists. My name is Erica, a teacher of students with visual impairments and a certified orientation and mobility specialist. I worked in education for nearly 22 decades, not 20 years and two decades, not 20 decades. That would be just too much. Uh, and a variety of capacities. And most recently as a TVI in Cupertino, California, before I made the trek over to Florida to attend FSU um, for my doctoral students, where I currently try to wrangle some undergraduates into good TVIs on the road. Then next, we, oops, we have Jerry. Jerry Hart is joining us from California from the Blind Babies Foundation. She is a vision impairment specialist at the Blind Babies Foundation in San Francisco. She works in the homes of all the babies in the city who have visual impairments. Her families encompass all income levels and many languages and cultures. Jerry has worked with babies and preschoolers who have a visual impairment and those with additional disabilities since 1974, which is why we have her here. We need her knowledge. She is a strong advocate of the infant mental health approach to serving families. And next we have Nan. Nan McMillan is joining us from Tampa, Florida. She is a teacher of students with visual impairments and a certified orientation and mobility specialist. She serves students with visual impairments from grades pre-K through 12th grade in Hillsborough County. She is also an adjunct professor for Florida State University Visual Disabilities Education Program. She is passionate about encouraging independence, especially in the early education years through adapted classroom and home routines. Our learning objectives will uh, encompass where um, we are first going to define career readiness, as in what that means for young children, how do we teach children about jobs and everything else that goes along with them. Then we will identify some age appropriate activities and we'll attempt to correlate everyday activities with the ECC that is our professional um, uh, best practice. And with that, I will ask Leanne to uh, start our poll real quickly. Okay, the question is, do you currently work with children between the ages of zero to five? And we know some of you might not, and that is just fine, but it does let us know who's out there. I'm going to let that come in. We're at about 70%, and it is okay if you could not answer it. This just gives us an idea. 71% of you said yes, 23% no. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you so much. This is going to help us um, make sure that we answer and tailor our answers to you. So with that said, oops, um, welcome back to those of you who attended our first webinar about a month ago. And welcome to those of you whose interest got piqued by the topic of career readiness in preschool. Maybe you are here to see what kind of nonsense we might have cooked up for you, um, or if this is legit. And there is a way to relate these two topics, which are often not mentioned in the same sentence. First, a quote you will hear from me throughout this series, because I want our time to be centered on it. This quote is especially important when we're speaking of our young children. And that is from Karen Wolf. And the quote goes like this, never do for a child what you believe that child has the potential to do. Anticipate they, that they can do, make them prove that they cannot. Begin by assuming that they can. Most of the ideas we share will be based on Dr. Wolf's work, and I want to make sure that we credit her appropriately. In this webinar series, we focus on how we can relate career education, one of the nine areas of the expanded core curriculum with specific age groups, Yet our main thread connecting these webinars is the fact that the majority of visually impaired and blind adults are still not holding meaningful careers or even just jobs. 
We believe that when, if we begin to think and plan with the end in mind, we can change this unfortunate trajectory. When it comes to career education and young people, we must begin with reframing our mindsets. Experiences in the family are the most influential in the early years of children's lives. Because truth be told, career education begins at home, intensifies during the preschool years and extends throughout children's school careers. Their learning is not just about work, vocations or occupations, but in these early years, it is rather centered around the very important foundational skills. Children need to learn how to take care of their individual basic needs as independently as possible. You all know, you all know of these, but here are some. Feeding, toileting, dressing, hygiene. Some of us have heard 14-year-olds who have never showered independently. And gaining skills in social interactions. Through these activities, children learn about their abilities, gain skills in communication, social interaction, leisure skills, and develop their interests. And all these combined lay a foundation for their quality of life for adulthood. Our VI students have the same needs as sighted children. We all know that we can need to ensure that what they miss out on due to their lack of access to incidental learning, we provide the essential direct experiences. Some of the most mundane facts related to career education are learned via observations. By using descriptive narration or helping them build pictures and concepts using words, which Dr. Joel Snyder from Audio Description calls, quote, painting a picture using descriptive works, words, quote, quote, we can help our students to learn how roles and occupations can be related to what clothes their parents wear, how that relates to some people wearing uniforms, some that get dirty because they are mechanics, and some uh, must always remain clean, such as surgeons. All these details we might consider minor are essential for concept building for our students with VI. When it comes to career education, another slide you will see over and over in this series is this table we created in terms of responsibilities. With the expanded core curriculum, and the changes in statutes and state regulations that are slowly trickling in, there are many areas all vision professionals can address and also work together with additional related service providers to ensure that our students get what they need to be successful in their futures. We will talk about a little bit about how this overlaps and this interrelatedness through this presentation. In the Foundations of Education book chapter 24, um, Dr. Wolf outlined for us some competencies upon which all IFSP and IEP goals should be based on to ensure the gains in foundational skills. Early intervention programs and preschool settings introduce students with VI to compensatory skills they will use throughout their lives, such as reading, writing, braille as needed, and give opportunities to learn about work and establishing good habits across their everyday functioning in life. So let's take a look at these competencies. The first competency is learning to listen. Learning to listen has many components. We often do not stop and think about it as we take it for granted because it is learned incidentally for the typical population of students. Learning to listen is essential in developing both survival and play skills. When children do not orient toward a peer when they attempt a connection, that sighted child will assume they are being ignored because societal rules assume orienting toward a speaker is the norm, which means we need to teach our students to turn toward the sound of someone speaking. How do we do that? Using descriptive words when we work with babies. Let me ask you, how many times did you say to a child, look at me when I'm talking to you? And using that tone too. I will not get into the neurotypical and atypical special education lingo here, but you do know what I mean. As adults, we expect appropriate, immediate responses to our requests, and typical children pick these up incidentally. The second competency is following directions. Just five seconds ago, I asked, asked you, had you asked a child to look at you when you are talking? 
when a student with VI is not turning toward the speaker, they are essentially not following directions. Isn't it an interesting oxymoron? Yet many of our students might have eccentric viewing needs, which appears as though they are looking away. Many can have hearing loss, therefore by orienting their good ear toward the sound is essential for them for paying attention. So who do we educate? The public or the child or both? As a team, what we need to do is find the best way a child can communicate both expressively as well as receptively. Before they make it to preschool, we can work on a child's auditory, auditorily and figuratively following the parent around the house. And we ensure that by descriptive narration. Imagine this, is the, imagine this, this, this internal dialogue that I'm speaking of is that when you walk into a room and you forgot why you got there, and then you're talking to yourself in, the, in your head, but you say it out loud. That's what I'm meaning about consistent narration. We start, we start with one small word directions for our students with all children and then build their skills as they learn. A simple stop in a firm tone could save their lives when they are working on a street crossing in O&M once they have arrived in elementary school, which means we must also implicitly teach tone, cadence, and rhythm of speech. All these skills will build cognition and the ability to follow multi-step directions. Indulge me in the chat, please. The third competency is learning to be responsible. Would you please put in the chat, what ways can we teach our babies and preschoolers of how to be responsible? Let's take 30 seconds to a minute. How do we teach responsibility? How to teach preschoolers to be responsible? Put toys away, look at that in all caps. Pick up toys, cleaning up after themselves. Oh, those messes, I love those messes. Messes mean they are learning. Personal effects, mm -hmm. Oh, I like that, scraping their plates in the garbage after eating. Stephanie, we need to chat. I'm teaching independent living skills this summer for my TVIs to bees. Um, I need some strategies for that stuff. Um, help their friends when needed. Ooh, I like that. And picking up their own clothing. If we could just teach adults to put the sock inside the hamper and not next to it, wouldn't that be fabulous? <laughs> Get the diaper for the baby. Mm -hmm. Ha ha, anytime. Um, I don't, I'll take you up on that, Stephanie. Um, and carry their backpacks. Isn't that interesting? When I was doing my uh, student teaching for my uh, K through five teaching certificate, um, I have seen a cultural difference in which where I was doing my uh, internship, the moms carried the backpacks for their children and choose a book from a bookshelf. So very nice. Thank you so much for that. Those are awesome. So learning to be responsible. So let me share some of the ones that uh, Dr. Wolf uh, mentions. We, get, we can begin um, teaching responsibilities um, with starting with turn taking. I blow raspberries on a child's arm. In return, they giggle. I take a cookie. I give it a cookie. We wait in the line at the grocery store because cutting is not pretty, nor is socially acceptable. And hopefully, we expect our students to clean up after themselves, which seems to be a very um, much a, an area of need, it seems, in, based on your chat responses. Um, and Unless the child has delayed motor development or restrictions in their mobility, there's no reason whatsoever why a child cannot take their plate to the sink or put their dirty clothes in their own hampers. All these will help them follow not the social, but classroom and later societal norms. Competency number four is organizational skills. We spoke about cleaning up about one Self. Apparently, that's a very important social norm that we have, we all have. Um, and I want to share with you a story. When I was a child, and that was in Eastern Europe and in the 70s, we did not grow up with having our own rooms. So, which meant we played in the living room, and that is a place socially used by the family, therefore it always had to be clean, right? Because that's where guests came also. So when I was a toddler, we had this green soft blanket of which I still have an emotional and physical memory of. Uh, and it's also associated with my grandmother. 
which was placed on the floor. And I can make as big of a mess as I could on that blanket. You see, that was my visual, tactile, and physical boundaries to my space, while also provided boundaries for the adults to step over. Okay. So then when I was finished, in no particular order, I was expected to clean up when I was told, listening and following directions. And I had two large drawers in which I piled all my stuff. As long as there were no items on the ground and the blanket was put away, no one cared how precisely a three-year-old cleaned up their toys. These high expectations allowed my parents to step on minimal number of Legos at 2 a.m. Organizational skills do not have to be overcomplicated, but functional. We can expect our students to put their dirty sock in the hamper and keep their outside shoes by the door. And by expecting them to put their dirty plate in the sink, we teach them communal and social functioning of spaces. <clears throat> and my favorite, yes. Oh, somebody, I thought I heard something. Competency five is about learning to play. The previous four competencies, listening, following directions, responsibility taking, and organizational skills, all assist in developing appropriate play skills. Who would have thought? When play skills are effective, they lay the very important foundation for social and work rules. A child's work is play. It has been said by many, and I actually subscribe to this as my philosophy. Some of you might know, um, some people know me on here, that I began as a preschool teacher many years ago. And my belief is that play is the foundation for all learning, from science to math to literacy and functional life skills. So I introduced our undergrads at FSU to Mildred Parton's stages of play, which she wrote about in 1929, nearly a millennia ago. Then use her six stages, which range from unoccupied, solitary to cooperative play to illustrate the importance of explicitly teaching play skills to the students with VI. Due to that lack of incidental learning, students with VI need assistance in developing their understanding of object permanence, as well as their sensory efficiency and compensatory skills to be able to have functional play skills, which later will turn into work skills. So what do I mean by these? Well, Think of the simple game of a peekaboo with a typical child. As their brains grow, and we know myelination, you know, the size and number of folds in the brain, happens through direct experiences. Children learn that just because mom is not in the room, they still exist and return. The game of peekaboo helps developing this understanding. Mom disappears behind a book or hands, but then with a smile returns. This simple game can help with attachment building, social interactions, as well as object permanence. So we need to teach this explicitly descriptive narration to our students. Many times we see students with VI in a corner playing alone. That is the second stage in the six stages of play development. And whose fault is that, that the child is not engaging, have not been taught and facilitated their learning playing skills? Don't get me wrong, I am not blaming. I'm simply pointing out that we often concentrate so much on independent living skills, like picking up after self and putting in the backpack and et cetera, and academic skills that we ignore the many areas we can cover with play. I could go on this for multiple hours, um, but I don't have time for that. But just we have to remember, we must begin with teaching our students to engage in play. And that starts with those raspberries on a baby's hand. And lastly, the sixth and final competency Dr. Wolf speaks of is fantasizing about adult rules. OK, what are we talking about here, fantasizing? How can we assist a blind student fantasizing when that is often connected in our understanding with vision? And this ideal visualization is where we connect back to Dr. what Dr. Snyder said, painting pictures with words. By using that descriptive narration, we give meaning to words, which helps our students build their concepts of color to adult roles. When we take to a baby to a doctor's office, we can often, we, uh, we can describe what is happening and that reduces stress to all. But due to our own anxieties, 
we often begin to talk over a child as the two adults converse about the child's needs. Have you met that amazing pediatrician who gets eye level to a child and actually talks to the child? Get that doc. This is the time we inadvertently teach our students with VI that their opinion of their bodies does not matter because we speak over them and they have no say. And this continues into IFSPs and IEPs. But I digress. In preschool and often at home, we have dress up time. Halloween is all about pretend. I am 100% sure that out of our 96 uh, people who are present, at least half are Halloween super fans, because that seems to be a, a, a US thing, right? We dress up. How many times have you, as a child, put on mom's high heels and pearls, regardless of if you're a male or a female, put on red lipstick, hopefully on your face and not on the wall, and paraded around in front of a mirror? We do not have to go far on social media to find hilarious examples of these. But how many times have we facilitated this type of play with our children? Drama corners exist in preschools for a reason, because we know it is developmentally necessary to play with adult roles. However, this is one of those areas where we must be culturally sensitive. I had a parent who was upset because their son dressed up as a princess at school. I had a parent who was upset because we used a variety of beans and rice for sensory play while they taught at home that playing with food is inappropriate. Regardless, when we work with students with VI, we must offer as many sensory activities as possible, attempting to not offend. And we can achieve this by getting to know our families and valuing their input into our practices, explaining why this is important, as in teaching to play, Discussing occupations and social norms all help build the toolbox of our students for a fulfilled future. Phew. Now that is enough about me talking, and I will hand it over to Jerry, who has a, the amazing experience of working with babies. Please take it away. Jerry, you need to unmute. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, next slide. How a family adjusts to finding that their child is blind is crucial to the expectations that will be placed on that child. Expectations that they will be independent, get a college education, and obtain employment. One of the main components of bonding with a newborn happens when your baby gazes into your eyes. A little later, their smile when they see their parent makes it easy to forgive the sleepless nights. This is the, one of the most common longings of parents whose young baby is blind because babies, even though you, if you see preschoolers, they're smiling when they hear their parents, young babies don't do this automatically. Stepping in early and showing parents other cues that their baby knows them and prefers them is invaluable in promoting bonding and acceptance. Sometimes a baby who can't see their parent coming cries when they're, pick when they're picked up, making the parent feel that their baby is rejecting them. Some of my first advice on meeting a family is explaining the need to announce who's walking in the room. Hi, Lucy, it's mommy. Telling the baby what's gonna happen. I'm going to pick you up. Giving a physical cue, like putting your hands on the baby and counting in your head to 10 to give the time, give the baby time to process before you pick them up. Pacing is very important all throughout a blind child's life. Families may have gone through difficulty getting pregnant, have, has, may have had several miscarriages, premature birth, the baby may have had surgery, and the families may have experienced me, um, medical visits that only pointed out what was wrong with their baby. Listening to a parent's story and valuing their baby is essential in understanding what they're dealing with. 
the family culture also has a big influence on how a family raises their baby. Do they spoon feed, feed all their children until they're five years old? Then we can't expect them to think that a blind child is going to be different. Do they expect their child to be independent very early? Do they look at every experience from babyhood on as a path to get their child into an Ivy League college? Are they having trouble getting the grandparents who are babysitting while they work to agree not to carry the baby all day long? In every instance, the biggest thing to remember in supporting families is a quote by Jerry Paul, infant mental health specialist, how you are is more important than what you do. Next slide. Nancy Ackeson, the first vision impairment specialist at Blind Babies Found. Oh, next, next slide. It's okay, Nancy, Jerry, just keep going. Okay. Nancy Ackeson, the first vision impairment specialist at Blind Babies Foundation starting in the late 1940s stressed, I truly believe that intervention is more than a recipe. You cannot measure a spoon of this and a cup of that and give it a quick stir and presto, the problem is solved. Teaching only from a curriculum is not parent friendly and does not meet the needs of either the baby or the family. Instead, we look at embedding the important components of learning into the everyday activities of the family. The three most vision dependent parts of learning are building concepts, building a base for language, and understanding spatial relations. <clears throat> to help build concepts, we employ the idea of experiential learning, taking the baby through everyday activities that the parent is doing from infancy on. How does the bathtub fill up? The tub is empty. Let's turn on the faucet. The water goes on, the water goes off. The water is cold. Now the water is warm. Now the tub is full of water and we can take a bath. Let's do the laundry. The clothes in the basket are dirty. Let's put them in the washer. When it turns on, it jiggles and makes a sound. When it's finished, clothes are wet. Let's take them out of the washer and put them in the dryer. When it's finished, the clothes are warm. As the child, as children get older, they can begin to sort off. Let's take all the socks out of the clean laundry. Um, let's, let's take daddy's big socks and, and out and, and from your little socks. All around the house, babies can begin to learn open clothes on, off, in front of, behind, by your left hand, in, out, on top of, under. 18 month olds can help peel a mandarin drop pieces of vegetables into a pot. A two-year-old can help bake, even cracking eggs with help. We also use active learning, a philosophy developed by Lily Nielsen based on the belief that infants and toddlers with vision impairment would benefit from having opti optimal opportunities to learn rather than from being trained or taught. It involves setting up environments which make learning opportunities accessible to the baby, such as hanging objects in such a way that any movement will put a child in contact with an object. The objects chosen have elements that can be compared, such as texture, temperature, length, and weight. Babies are allowed to play without instruction without people talking to them or praising them for what they have done and without people jiggling or making noise with the objects in the environment. This approach encourages independence 
and respect for the idea that the baby is able to learn independently when the environment is accessible to them. I just asked the mother of a, of a little girl who's, a, who's totally blind, who's about to turn three, what, what, was, what was one of the main things that we did together that made you realize that your child could, was bright and could succeed in life. And she said that setting up her toy bar and seeing that her child who before that had just um, lain there because there was nothing to look around at, to see her begin to engage with the toys using her hands and her feet, knowing where the toys were, bringing them to her mouth. She said that was what really turned her around. We also use songs and body movements to teach body awareness. To build a base for language, we start as soon as the baby is referred, which is usually at two to three months with object communication using a diaper. The family keeps diapers in every room that they're in with the baby, but only changes the diaper at a specific place. Before picking up the baby to change the diaper, they bring the diaper to the baby, place it on their chest and tell them we're going to change their diaper. Then they pick them up uh, and take them to the changing table. This way the baby has time to process what's going to happen and become familiar with the route to the changing table. As, as the baby gets a little older, we begin to build anticipation with games like, I'm going to get your tummy and then tickling their tummy giving that wait time to see if the baby anticipates what's gonna happen or games like one, two, three, go to give them time to start an activity. We introduce books early and introduce print braille books to expose the child to words very early, just like a sighted child who sees words around them for years before they're expected to learn to read. Braille readers have higher rates of academic achievement and employment among people who have a vision impairment. Because it's impossible to know how much vision children will have when they are young babies, I introduced the books with the idea that even if your baby is able to read print, it may be too slow of reading for high school and college. As it's easier to learn Braille at the same time they are learning print, it's best to learn both at the same time. This explanation also reinforces high expectations. My child will go to college. Um, next. Spatial relations. No, go go back, please. Jerry, I think we're missing a slide, so just uh, oh, you can okay. go on. Yeah. All right, spatial relations. When we walk into a room, we see a ceiling and four walls. We quickly learn that if we are sitting on the sofa, the television is in front of us and the door is to the right. Without vision, one can never experience all four walls at once. We can use an active learning environment like a little room or a four-sided toy bar to give the idea of a room with a ceiling. If the baby is always placed in this environment in the same way, they quickly learn that if the beads are to my left, the measuring spoons will be on my right and the aluminum pie pan is by my feet when I kick. The baby is able to move around in the environment but has a starting point to orient. This, the hula hoop in this picture is an example of, of an inexpensive, easily made active learning experience. It is based on independent exploration, encourages a baby to work on pivoting and prone at their own pace and with objects which uniquely motivate them. It encourages busy hands 
and lets a baby explore different textures as tentatively or joyously as they need. A baby who has been raised in a joyous and supportive environment, who learns to handle experiences independently, who understands the world around them and can move about with confidence is a baby who is on their way to gainful employment. Thank you, Jerry. That was fabulous. And I'm sorry we missed uh, one or two slides somehow got lost in the translation. But with that said, we um, want to engage you in the chat again. So with what you heard from me regarding competencies and all the brilliance that Jerry was sharing, we would like to ask you, what kind of ways have you connected the competencies and the ideas Jerry talked about to ONM, orientation and mobility skills, for the zero to five population. So if you could just drop it in the chat to see how you are correcting ONM skills and all these competencies that we need to get. Um, I think it was Stephanie who said the scraping of the um, plate. I would say that would be a clear ONM skill because we gotta make it to that trash can. So we're looking for ideas like that. And you already have some coming through, Eric. Yes, I Leanne. see. Exploring a Sphinx set. That's that's awesome. Um, spatial awareness in basic on them. Yes. Body awareness through songs and games. You know, one of my um, TVIs to be asked me, why are we always doing games when it comes to ONM? And I just looked at her like, why are you asking me this silliness? It is all play and games, right? Um, being a human GPS, oh, I wanna know how to be that. That's probably you're referring to cardinal directions or left and right, correct? Or telling you how you're moving between the grocery aisles. We're turning left, we're turning right. Going outside when it rains, yes, Julie. Especially when you are in San Francisco, that happens a lot more often. So is in Florida where we had downpours, which is why we cannot go outside because it's too wet. Um, using long whisks or spoons to bang bowls. Oh, I love cacophony. It is amazing to make noise. Push toys. Yes. Push toys are fabulous when we are wondering if the child will ever walk, right? It's a pre-AMD, an assistive mobility device. We can use push toys for that. Oh, thank you, Lori, for clarifying. Like we are passing tro Tory Pines that can, yes. Cans of pee. Very nice. Thank you so much, Lori. I'm appreciating um, the, the clarification. And then, are you ready for your orientation and mobility take? Take it away. Yes. Well, thank you, guys. Um, so, well, for, first thing I want to talk about is what is um, the importance of O&M? So, for me, as a, both a TVI and an O&M specialist, I fully believe that O&M is incorporated in every single bit of the ECC. Um, any skill that you're going to be teaching for O&M, such as organizational and systematic search, following directions goes along with routes, and encouraging independence can help make safe travel happen. Um, so today what I'm going to talk about is three different ways you can either at home or in the classroom use O&M to encourage career skills. So first things first, Class jobs. So some of these target uh, competency. Oh my gosh, competencies is learning to listen. Um, you, they, it teaches following directions, learning to be responsible, and organizational skills. My big thing is here is we're gonna let that blind child have a job. Um, you can go to the next slide, Erica, or Leah. Be and this is why um, most of the time in my experience, I see that the teachers, especially in the preschool, they shy away from giving the child a job. But as an o &M instructor, I like to go in there and prove, not necessarily that teacher's wrong, but prove that that child is capable, even if they have a visual impairment by doing pre-teaching the job and demonstrating to the teacher how to use very specific language. like the light switch is um, just above the shelf on the right side so that child can go and reach and know exactly where they're going. Another one that I see that gets 
um, my students kind of sometimes get taken out of is cleaning up. And I saw that all, a lot of y'all said, clean up, clean up, clean up. And I think this is a big thing that my students sometimes get the easy way out on. And, but this is an opportunity to teach great organizational skills and searching skills. And for some of my kids, maybe it's not safe to move around with a bucket or something, but they can be the bucket holder and be handed a toy. Or they can ask, hey, Johnny, can I help you clean up the animals? And that's teaching some social skills a lot that will later on get them down the road to a career skill. We're just giving those jobs gives them success. So the next area is pretend. So I know we've talked about this already. Um, so some examples, so some of these target competencies that we're going to hit is definitely play, um, learning response um, to be responsible through practicing different um, roles in our community, learning to listen, organizational skills, and again, following directions. So how, how we can make this happen is I love the dress up bins that have every single different type of um, career out there from police officer, I have a zookeeper, we have somebody brought in a tiny bee hot, uh, beekeeper hood. And even though some of those jobs aren't necessarily um, realistically attainable for a child, um, you know, with modern technology, you never know what could happen, but it's still a good experience for them to practice because it builds concepts, it gets them moving. And you can, and some of the ways that I think about bringing those back in, is like with a grocery, let them pretend they're bagging groceries, that's gonna teach them that systematic searching that they'll need if they drop something on the ground, if they're trying to locate their cubby, all sorts of things. And later on, if they're adults trying to find their cubicle where they're gonna sit at a desk. Um, being a zookeeper, we can do cardinal directions. I like to make fun maps with my kids and they get to be the zookeeper and they'll give it to their classmates and they go find the zebra or the giraffe and they have to go north. And then, or if we need to take it a step back, maybe right or left. And books, books are a big thing. Um, read a book about a job. Pete the Cat is great at this and go play that book. Be that book. Have them get the, um, I just read with a student about Pete the Cat going into um, space. Get, make up an astronaut thing. Let them experience that because this might be the only time they get to play it and it gives them that imagination they need. And then for my last area, uh oh. Okay. Anyway, the last area is work experience and that our work exposure. So the big thing about O and M is that, and because our kids aren't getting into their own learning, they're not riding in that grocery cart and seeing the bagger, the manager, the bakery person, um, the stock boy. We have to O and M allows them to go to that learning. Um, because they aren't necessarily getting it. So when you go and do your mundane tasks, mom and dad, bring your kid along, please. Like if you go get an oil change, take them, let them meet a mechanic, let them meet the tire salesman at Kaufman Tire. Let them do that because it's giving them exposure and ideas of what could they do. And those are later conversations like, oh, I remember when I was seven, I went and mom, let me talk to this mechanic. I think I could do that because X, Y, Z and really helps us shape later on. Um, and then also in the class in, at school, one of my favorite activities to do is take each week, my student and I will walk and move to one different area of the school. So like the front office or the library or the art room. And we focus on that teach, or that staff member for the week. What does Miss Patty do? She's the principal secretary. What is what are some tasks she has to do? Where does she have to go? And things like that. So that's getting them out and moving. Also, it's sneakily very great for exposure to the rest of the schools that sometimes aren't used to a visually impaired kid, learning what it means to be visually impaired and that they are still very capable. And I think that is all I've got, Erica. I know I look like. 
before and, you move on, I wanted to give your slide justice because the little guy thank is adorable. You. <laughs> so this is this is one of my little guys, actually, everyone. Um, and this is when we went actually to go see Miss Patty, the principal secretary, and she gave him a little heart. They were putting Valentine's, as you can see behind him. Um, there are some some mailbox cubbies for the teachers, and we were um, putting the Valentines in there. Uh, Miss Nan might have had to get more of the taller ones, but he still took his walker over there. It took us 35 minutes to get there, but we made it. Um, and that's another thing about O&M and thinking about the future is that, yes, it takes 35 minutes at the beginning of the year, but now it's taking us 10 to walk from point A to point B. And that's from that continuous exposure. Just like right now, if you can continuously give your child or your students exposure to different jobs, that's going to help their reading, their literacy, their writing, and their future ability to, of employment. Thank you, Nan. I apologize for You're some welcome. reason. My PowerPoint is not liking me today, but we have Leon for the save. So here we are to our last, um, we're approaching landing and um, we have some specific tools that we would like to share with you. So Leon, you can go to the next one. Some of these tools are assessment to find the gaps in your students' knowledge. So one is using ecological inventories to figure out what opportunities or potential barriers are there for our students' engagement. Creating a discrepancy analysis, which is essentially looking at what typically um, developing same age peers do and can do, what their skill levels are, and where our student might be lagging behind. Both of these, um, we provided two handouts for you. You can have the form and run with them. Consulting with related service providers. We have been um, kind of highlighting here that Jerry being a early vision, um, blind, working for blind babies, working with families, engaging the families, engaging um, all the um, professionals working with the uh, students, Nan with the O&M, Nan is also TVI, so she knows about, you know, moving them together. This little boy with the walker, working with the PT, um, working with the OT, all those together will help us um, at least by encouraging the skills, right? Because we cannot teach the same skills because we are not certified in them, but we can encourage appropriate use of the skills that the other professionals are teaching. And above all, um, we always must provide immediate, consistent, constructive, and positive verbal reinforcement while maintaining high expectations for our children. Next. So we just have uh, a couple of uh, um, ideas. As, we, as I was preparing for the, like the skeleton of this presentation, um, I kept coming back to the Richard Scary books. Yes, they are absolutely inaccessible for low vision or blind students. It is not a book that you can make tactile. It's just impossible. However, even though they are overwhelming and busy, they might work under a micro uh, CCTV uh, if you have a low vision student. And if nothing else, they can give you as the parent or teacher ideas and concepts that you should be talking about. Next. Then we have Berenstein Beer, Bears. I almost said beers. Maybe that's what I need. It's Friday. Um, Berenstein Bears cover many topics, including career educational topics. They, you all mentioned messy rooms. Apparently, that's our pet peeve. So messy rooms, troubles with chores. Um, I would like to say here that we need to actually assign chores to our children. Um, it won't kill them. Um, going to the doctor, visiting the dentist, etc. They are amazing books. Next. And once we are uh, in school and we have academic students, um, the I Can Read series has six levels. It is guided learning and not everybody believes in that, you know, they are reading scientists, but they are easy, single word, sometimes um, just three word sentences. So they are very easy at the beginning and they can be found in kindergarten and elementary school uh, classrooms. They are easy to braille um, and at least it can be those books that Nan was um, referring to that let's read about it and then play it out. Next. And of course, there are plenty of books that might work for our low vision students or books that we can turn into tactile books, as Nan mentioned, uh, I think 
I don't know if it was a private conversation or during this presentation, but that, that there are a lot of books that we need to actually create for our students. So there are a closed line can be made tactile. It's a real thing. We have closed planes. We can mess around with them, right? And, and we can have real clothes. So there are books that we can make tactile. We can make um, experience boxes. And there are lots and lots of YouTube videos about jobs for children um, and cartoons. Because guess what? Watching movies with audio description may also provide you opportunities to discuss jobs, such as what are the responsibilities of superheroes? You never know. Next. And the main idea is providing experiences and learning opportunities with appropriate descriptive narrations. We all spoke about outings, taking them um, to places, allowing them to explore, and then telling them what they are exploring, having those conversations, and then taking the child to work or to the mechanic and explaining what the doctors are doing with them, not just to them. And with that said, we are coming to our reference pages. Um, we are highlighting four books um, with this presentation, Teaching Life Differently, Reach Out and Teach, and Dr. Wolf's Skills for Success, as well as Foundations of Education. So Leanne, if you could just jump to the book sources. Yep, and then that is our end of the presentation. And we are open for questions. I am checking the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop, drop your um, questions there and either Jerry, Nan or myself can answer them or any kind of comments you have. Um, what we've given you is, is it um, something that's manageable or is it overwhelming? While those questions are coming in, I would like to share on the audio description end of the world, APH is actually having a series of audible description uh, webinars, really trying to help build your skills as well. So we have accessible media, which is talking about audible descriptions. That's coming up on May 3rd, a couple days from now. And then we're going further with meaningful image descriptions for social studies content on May 17th. And then going one further, May 24th, audible image descriptions in a pinch. Well, this is all talking about pictures, graphs, charts, maps, et cetera. It could definitely help you apply to a real life scenario that's happening for career readiness. Thank you, Leanne. And we have a question from Julie. Jerry, I think this is a question to you because you're nearest to the student uh, parents. So I'm going to read the question to you. Do you have ideas for how to quickly persuade parents and other professionals to get on board with teaching all of these things? So what is your take on parents? Chocolate. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> understanding, understanding what a parent has been through and what their um, kind of where they are and why they are where they are. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think quickly is, is always possible. It's, um, it's working with a parent where they are and trying to get them one step closer. Sometimes it's showing, you know, maybe if, if you have a child in a classroom having <clears throat> having a um, taken a video of them doing something that the parent didn't realize they could do. Um, if I could ahead. piggyback on Jerry real quick. Um, one way that um, I, I'm a big advocate for parent involvement and sometimes they just don't know how um, what our job is and um, a lot of times just like Jerry was saying it's a picture speaks a thousand words. And so with my parents approval, I take lots and lots of pictures and videos and almost every session, especially my, my little nuggets, I'm sending pictures, sending them so they can see what we're doing and honestly how happy their child is and things like that. And then it gives them an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I get a lot of times, especially on O&M, like, why were you doing that? Why, what, why were you using that language or that particular term? How can, what can I do? So 
opening your your door allows them to come in, which is usually what they need and um, because their doors are typically closed. So um, I just find constant communication gets you a lot, gets you where you need to be a lot faster. So then when you're trying to get other professionals like administration on board, you got the parent, you got the administration typically. Awesome. Thank you for that, Nan. That was a great addition. And then we have from Lori sharing that Disney Plus is adding uh, uh, AD to all their content, which is fabulous. So if you guys need to advocate for that for your students and to, to tell the parents if they are um, screen friendly. And then Brenda is saying, I have asked other professionals to picture this kid in another 10 years and what they would want the child to be doing. Yes. And that is how we started today saying we have to keep the end goal in mind, which is we want professionals, somebody who's happy in their own place, living independently as much, you know, independent as to their individual levels and being productive members who are having a good quality of life all together. Um, so with that demystifying blindness skills, yes, absolutely. If we could just do that, but often our TV eyes even look at our students like, oh, versus, oh, I'm expecting you to do that, you know? So yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for your attention. We would like to thank you for um, coming back and listening to us. And I will turn it over to Leanne to close us out. Well, thank you very much, Erica, Jerry, and Nan. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, I'm gr glad this is a series because we're moving forward in a couple of weeks with our next one. So stay tuned, but thank you very much for presenting today.